Welcome to Ministry in Motion, where we explore best practices for your ministry in the 21st century. I'm Anthony Kent, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to today's program. Our guest today is Willie Hux. Willie, welcome. So glad to be here. Now, Willie, just tell us just briefly a little about your, your current role, what you do in ministry at the moment. I currently serve as the associate editor for Ministry Magazine, and a part of that responsibility also includes pastoral training. Good, good. Now, you've had quite an extensive number of years of, of ministry. Tell us a little about your, your experience in ministry. Well, most of my ministry thus far has been in pastoral ministry. I started, of course, in pastoral ministry, and from there I did some teaching on the university level in theology department, and from there I came to serve as associate editor of ministry. Fantastic. Now, today's program, we're looking at the, the whole art of appreciation yes. because so much of, of ministry that we do is in the context of volunteers. Yes. And obviously, churches don't have enough to pay the volunteers. No. And, and even those who are drawing a wage or a salary there's typically not enough to pay them for what they're actually doing as well. No, definitely never will be. So uh, appreciation is an important component. And recently you wrote an article in Ministry Magazine and the article was called Saying Thank You to Your Congregational Team Members. And I was wondering if we could explore that a little yes. in, in, in today's program. Certainly. Now, the first point you made in that article was Refer to your congregational team members as colleagues or partners in ministry rather than officers. Would you like to e expand upon that for us, please? Yes, gladly. I, I would be glad to. Uh, so often when we think of officers, if I can use the term officers just for a moment, it comes across as being rather bureaucratic, uh, rather, uh, rather political mm -hmm. in, in nature. Uh, I believe in... Uh, and equality, as it were, between pastors and members in that we are all a part of the body of Christ. And while we each have our different functions, uh, keeping that in mind, as we were to keep that in mind, we'd understand that we really are co-laborers together. Okay, you, you're describing their equality to, yes. together in this uh, as well. So would you, would you like to expand that point a little more, Willie? Have you got an illustration of where you've seen that working very effectively? Well, I think in a lot of churches we see that working effectively. Uh, with, without talking so much about churches that I pastored, uh, that really is my experience. Uh, you know, in, in a nutshell, I never attempted to elevate myself on some pedestal. I chose to look at my church members as co-laborers with me in much the same way the different parts of the body uh, operate uh, in, uh, dependent, um, depending on one another uh, in this process. And I never had to tell them that this is what I do or, or this is what you do. Uh, rather, as we work together, we discovered that we really were partners for finishing the, the, the work that we had there in our community. Okay, you, you're describing there a mutual reliance upon one another. Yes. Yeah. Now, the second point you made in the article was to broaden the definition of colleague beyond elected personnel and assistants. Tell us more about that. Uh, so often we tend to think of the higher, quote unquote, offices in the church, those that are more visible than others. But there are so many that we don't see, uh, the, the children's teachers, mm -hmm. uh, the ushers, uh, the greeters, those that we don't pay much atten uh, attention to, uh, they also have a very important role. I'm thinking of for an example of one person who actually did not even hold an elected position in the church. But I remember when I had minor surgery one time, I knew that of all the people in my church who had powerful prayer lives, this woman who was blind, could not get around very well, I could depend on her at that time above so many others within my congregation uh, to, to get that prayer through that I needed. Did she hold an elected position? No. Uh, was she very well known in the church? No. But to me, that's what I mean when I talk about broadening the definition. 
Okay. So just because yeah. somebody isn't uh, e elected or appointed to a specific position in the church, they still have a very significant role within the church. Is that what you're saying? Everyone in the church has a significant role to play. Exactly. Yeah. Particularly in the function of ministry. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Now, the third point you made in your article was do not limit communication with colleagues only to those times when you need something. So often our church members believe that the only time that a pastor wants to communicate with them is when there is something that is needed. What I try to do as I was in pastoral ministry and even now in, in still a supervisory role as I am in right now is to just call them or to just stop by and visit and sort of shock them as where I call it shock therapy for mm -hmm. lack of a better mm -hmm. term. Well, they would invariably say, well, pastor, you know, what do you need? What can I do for you? And I would say, I don't need you to do anything. I'm just calling to see how are you doing? Right. You know, how's life treating you? Yeah. So no excuse, no particular reason, but I guess with that, your role modeling ministry and how ministry is this em embraceive image within the local church. That, that when we speak to people, we're not speaking with some ulterior motive. We are family. We are uh, one in Christ. Mm. And that unity and that harmony that comes from that unity, I'm, I'm sure, pervades then through the, the whole congregation. Yes, yes, yeah. it, it, yes, it definitely will. Terrific. Okay. Now, the fourth point you made in your article was be generous when you say thank you. Uh, when I wrote the article, I used the word generous. And of course, often after you write something, you say to yourself, I wish I had said it a little differently. I do believe in the generosity of expressing appreciation, of, of saying thank you. But so often when we say thank you, sometimes it can come across as being over the top, just being a bit too effusive. A, a better word that I would like to use rather than being generous is being genuine. Okay. Uh, being authentic because people can tell when you are trying to, as it were, butter them up. Mm -hmm. So I believe in being generous when a person says thank you. More than that, that saying I appreciate what you're doing has to be real, has to be authentic. It has to be, as I said earlier, it just has to be genuine. Terrific. Okay. Well, that's four very helpful points that we've looked at in the, the context of, of ministering in the sphere of appreciation and particularly ministering with, with volunteers. We're looking forward to following up with more of the points that you made in the article. For our viewers at home, if you'd like to see this article and access it, you're welcome to come to Ministry in Motion on our website, ministryinmotion.tv, and there you will find some, some links through to that article that, that Dr. Hux has written. But stay where you are. We'll be right back with more of Ministry in Motion.
back to Ministry in Motion, where our guest today is Pastor Willie Hacks, and our topic is Ministering in the Context of Appreciation. Now, Willie, we're, we're moving through a, a summarised version of your recent article in ministry. Tell us a little about the, the background to this. What, what initiated within you the, the urge to write this and, and this topic in general? Suppose there are many things that I could mention. I know there's not enough time, but just a couple of things that really got me started on this. As I touched on earlier, so often pastors are seen as existing on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately so, I would say. There, there obviously is a respect that is due to pastors. You know, the Bible even talks about that. Yeah. But as I talked about earlier, I wanted my church members to understand that there is an equality, uh, a, a, a priesthood of the individual, as it were, that, that we so often talk about. So in, I discovered that in expressing appreciation, they understood that collegiality that was to exist. And so often they would tell me, well, in times past, I've never really sensed that there has been uh, an appreciation for what I do. Thank you for thanking me mm. for what I do. Another thing that came into play was so often it appeared to me that pastors focus more on the preaching event or the teaching event or evangelism. All of these are very important. Please understand, sure. they're all very important. Uh, but church members were so often, uh, were, were often seen as it were pawns in a chess game. This is what I do. This is what you do to assist me. But I felt that it was more than that. It's a team effort that, that requires that we spend time appreciating one another. That was just part of what fueled this for me. Yeah. And, and if we are team members in this, then it needs to be legitimate yes. and authentic team membership. Real, authentic, genuine. Uh, uh, unfeigned, as it were, as mm -hmm. I touched on mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, it's that model of Jesus with his disciples, isn't it? Of eating a, a common meal together and, and being together with one, washing one another's feet and so forth. Uh, two of my favorite passages, and you just uh, alluded to the life of Jesus. I think so often of Matthew chapter 20, where he said to his disciples that the Son of Man did not come to be ministered unto, but to minister. He was, and you used this word earlier, an example. He mm -hmm. set the example. He mentored for his followers what he wanted them to do. He did not see himself as on this, uh, on this pedestal, as it were, um, so much so that he was not willing to wash their feet. Yeah. I, I think also another favorite passage of mine is in Exodus 32, where after the golden calf incident, uh, the, ch uh, the children of Israel were clearly in their idolatry. And Moses says to God, you know, yes, they sinned. They were wrong. Uh, if you have to blot anyone out, blot me out. Yeah, yeah. And it's that, that image of Jesus with, as the, the hen in a sense, isn't it? And protecting the chicks. Yeah, it's a, it's a gorgeous image. And it's a wonderful goal for churches to, to emulate yes. as well. Yeah. Now, coming back to, to your article, yes. Willie, I think we, we got up to point four. Let's, let's move on to point five. And your fifth point was do something tangible to say thank you. Tell us more about that. Usually when the word tangible is used, we think in terms of money. Mm -hmm. I understand, most pastors understand that if the average size of a congregation only measures in the dozens, you know, tangible in terms of financial is not going to be realistic. Some churches can afford, some pastors can afford something tangible in a financial sense. But keeping in mind that some churches are five members, 50, 500, however many, do what fits within your setting to say thank you, uh, whether it involves something financial or something much smaller, then go with that. For example, I remember a smaller church that I pastored at one time. All I could do was create my own certificates, as it were. Mm -hmm. you know, Computer-generated certificates didn't cost a lot of money, but for, them, for, for those to whom I was giving them, it was the thought 
that yeah. counted, that the pastor thought enough about them to express his appreciation in the way that he did, in the way that I did in that case. Right, okay. Well, that's, that's a, a great example and a, and a great point that you've made there as well. Your sixth point was don't single out in certain individuals to the exclusion of others. In other words, be inclusive. This touches on one of the biggest complaints that I have heard during my years of, of coaching, of pastoral coaching and of church coaching, mm -hmm. where so often it has been said, certainly in some cases, well, the pastor focuses on this person. He focuses on that person. What I have tried to do in my own practice of ministry is if I see you doing something that I find commendable, I thank you right there on the spot. Mm. Uh, there are occasions where a more public appreciation is warranted. I, I don't try to do that often, but I do do that when it is essential, when I find that it is essential to do so. But my practice has always been, you know, if you catch them doing something that is commendable, thank them there and thank them uh, as publicly as is needed, not so much focusing on what he does or what she does in terms of uh, a, a quote-unquote office, but help them to understand that you appreciate them for who they are, for what they have done to further the gospel. And, and when it does come to the times when you are thanking people publicly, do you mention names and the specific things that they've done? Uh, if it is something that is already widely known and recognized, then I find that to be something appropriate to do. Mm -hmm. What I have often found is that in this process of expressing things, people do things not so that you can come and say, well, look at what Mr. So-and-so did or what Miss So-and-so did. Uh, they would rather just do what they do and not be recognized. Yeah. But I think that there are times when a person needs to be publicly acknowledged. Uh, in my opinion, often few and far between uh, does it need to be something public of that nature. But by all means, I, I do find that it is essential to do that yeah. you know, from, from time to time. Right, and would you ever bring somebody up to the front of a church as a, as a means of thanking them? Well, I, I have, but once again, uh, it has been done few and far between, and it is usually as a result of something that everybody already knows about and something that they did that was heartfelt, right? that was genuine, that benefited the congregation, that benefited the community. But I would never do that, and it was never my practice, and it has never been my practice to do that so that they feel that I am trying to curry favor with them or I'm trying to build their ego or that I am trying to gain some ulterior uh, advantage down the road. You, you're, not, has, you're not setting them up as the pastor's favorite type of thing. No, no, I don't want to do that. And I don't want church members to think that that is the case because that is not what I do and that is not what I would encourage anyone to do. It has to be, uh, for me, the criterion the, the chief criterion has to be that everything that has been done has been done for the glory of God. Mm. Not for my glory, not for your glory, but for God's glory. Excellent point, excellent point. Ministering in the context of appreciation, you're watching Ministry in Motion. We'll be right back with more.
Welcome back to Ministry in Motion. Our topic today is ministering in the context of appreciation and our guest is Willie Hux. Willie, we're, we're motoring through these, these points from your article. We're up to point number seven, which was volunteer in their ministries from time to time as opportunities present themselves. Enlarge on that for us, will you? I recognize that not every church district is a one church district. Some pastors have two, four, 10, 12, depending on where you are in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, districts are large, so they cannot, they as the pastors cannot volunteer in every church all the time. But whenever opportunity presented itself for me, and I encourage other pastors to do the same, uh, take time to participate in the activities of the church. Don't do the work per se, but volunteer. A couple of quick examples. Uh, when my children were much younger, when they were in um, the beginning class, uh, church class, and as they moved up, I would sit in their class and uh, just observe what was going on, not to be nosy or anything, but to spend time with my children. Mm -hmm. I would help the teacher out Good. You know, of that class. And it helped build rapport not only with the teacher, but with the small children also. Uh, we have children's story in our, in our church. Mm -hmm. Other people usually did that, but I would do it from time to time. It helped bond me not only with the children, but with other participants who did the same thing. Yeah. And what about tasks that aren't so upfront? Do you imagine a pastor being involved with that sometimes? I know it. it yes, I, I do. Uh, sometimes it seems out of vogue to do those things. You know, that's what others are there for. Mm. But you know, I never minded going on, for example, uh, camperies, you know, with the young people and others are chopping wood and bringing it back to the camp. Well, why not do that also? Exactly. I enjoy doing that. Or if someone was doing some of the yard maintenance and I just happened to be at the church, had a little extra time, Nothing stopped me from doing that. That didn't mean that I was doing the work. It just meant that I was assisting as I could. Could I do it all the time? Of course not. Mm. But it helped to build those bridges of appreciation. Exactly. Now, the eighth point that you made in the article was inquire about their jobs, schooling, or whatever they do. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. Uh, life in church often for church members is only a part of their life. And I know there are many societies where the two are connected, almost inseparable. That's not the case everywhere. People work 40 hours a week in some societies and they give some of their other time uh, to the church. Well, I want them to know that I recognize that they do have a life outside of what goes on in the church setting. So what is it that you do for a living? Oh, so. What all is involved in that? Oh, you're retired now. So what's life like being retired? Oh, you're a college student. Please tell me, you know, what are you studying? Oh, you're in what grade? You're in the sixth grade? So what's your favorite subject? Everyone has a life outside of church. And to me, that was a part of building those bridges and helping them to understand, uh, to know that I understand to the degree that I can where they are and help me to understand even better. Exactly. And remembering and recalling those things in future conversations, yes. I imagine, are, are very important as yes. well. Now, the, the ninth point you made in your article was, remember that they have families and show sensitivity to their needs. And, and let me hasten to add, when I speak of family, I'm not necessarily thinking in terms of the quote unquote nuclear family, husband, wife, children. A uh, family does not necessarily mean that I'm married. Mm -hmm. It does not necessarily mean that I have children. There are single people who have ailing parents. And, and this is part of where I'm going when I say this. Remember that just because they are single does not mean that they don't have family. They have other obligations. Then there are many of us uh, who do have a spouse and children. Well, life is not just about church. It's about extracurricular activities for the children. Uh, it's about uh, various meetings here and there. It's about school projects. It's about helping children with homework. It's about spending time with my spouse. It's about all of these things. And it's the same for those who serve in our church as volunteers. And you know, I, I sense in this, it's when, when there are willing volunteers, it's so easy to load up those w yes. volunteers. But I sense what you're saying here, that it's important that we, we don't overload mm -hmm. those 
kind and generous folk, ministers that minister with us and, and overdo the, the requests that are placed before Rem them. Yes, yes. Remember that they love the church and are willing to volunteer their services, but please remember that they are people yes. first. Yes. They are people first and foremost who love God, who love his church, who love their congregation. Mm. Now the 10th point you made was that remember that partners in ministries, uh, partners in ministry, especially volunteers, are primarily answerable to God. In some respects, this takes me back to the very first thing that I said when we were at point one about pastors being on a pedestal. Uh, too often, and, and, and I don't want to sound like I'm putting all pastors on the same bus or throwing pastors under that bus because in my experience, most pastors are very conscientious, caring, loving, concerned, committed uh, to their congregations. Uh, having said all of that, remember, I, I always encourage pastors, I, I try to do this, I encourage other pastors to do the same, to remember that yes, you are the pastor, yes, they are church members, but they don't answer to you in every respect. Mm -hmm. Yes, in terms of the way that a church structure is set up, yes, they, they, they do show their respect to the pastor, but ultimately when all is said and done, God is the one to whom they answer. Not the pastor, not the board, not whoever it is, mm -hmm. God is the one to whom they answer. And, and, and I think if we as pastors remember that, we would, it would help us to keep things in perspective. And critically, we as the pastor, we answer in the same way, don't we? Absolutely. We're one before, before. Thanks so much, Willie. And we want to thank you for joining us in, for this program of Ministry in Motion. If you'd like more details, come and visit us on our website, ministryinmotion.tv a vast array of resources. But until next time, may God richly bless you.